Hello everyone, welcome to a very special episode of Living History. Today it's all going to be about the Battle of the Somme. In November last year I was very fortunate to spend quite a bit of time walking the battlefield of the Somme and I made a mini documentary about it called Walking the Battlefield of the Somme. And you can find it on YouTube, you can find it on our Facebook page. For those of you who haven't seen the video, uh, this is the audio from that video. So it won't make quite as much sense not seeing the visuals, obviously. But still, this will give you a taste for what we did when we walked the battlefields, for the adventures I had there, the explorations, and some of the amazing discoveries that I made while walking the battlefield of the Somme. Hopefully you'll listen to this. It'll encourage you to go and download the video. The video is available for free on YouTube, for free on our Facebook page, the Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours Facebook page. So please go and check it out. There's a couple more episodes in this series coming out in the next few weeks. So I'll also do a podcast with the audio from those ones as well. But for the meantime, please enjoy Walking the Battlefields of the Somme. The names of some battlefields are forever tarnished by the sheer scale of the suffering and the tragedy that occurred there. But it would be difficult to find a battlefield that can compete for either suffering or tragedy than this one. This is the Somme, and the fighting that occurred here between July and November 1916 was some of the bloodiest of the First World War. In this program, we're going to take you to sites associated with this iconic battle and tell the stories of the men who fought and died here. My journey begins on a foggy morning near the town of beaumont hamel in northern France. Here to show me around is battlefield guide John Anderson. Hello John. Hi Mud. Good to see you again. Great to see you. This is pretty impressive, Hawthorne Ridge Crater. It certainly is. It's one of a number of craters that were blown by the tunnelling companies of the Royal Engineers that marked the start of the Battle of the Somme. So this is on the first day, the 1st of July. This was on the 1st of July. This was the first of the mines to be exploded. Uh, it was fired at 20 past seven on the morning of the 1st of July. And famously, this is the only one that was filmed, uh, filmed by Geoffrey Malland. What were they trying to do? Why, why did they find it necessary to basically obliterate this whole section of German trench? The, the whole point of the craters, and, and there were a number of them blown, were to take out major German defensive positions. Uh, that it was felt would be very, very difficult uh, for us to capture. But this is on high ground. This has got a great line of fire all across the countryside that we can see uh, in the areas where the British soldiers were due to attack at 7.30. Well, we're certainly on high ground. You can see that, that we've got views. If the fog wasn't here, we'd have views <laughs> around the whole, uh, the whole battlefield. Which direction were the British coming from in their attack? Okay, they, they were coming from the west and attacking in an eastward direction. So, from this way they, were so they, they were coming from across here uh, and attacking uh, uh, up onto this lip here. And in fact, the, the first uh, British soldiers to, p to push forward shortly after this mine was fired actually got onto the rip, the, the lip of the crater there. Well, let's go and have a look, uh, have a sure. closer look at the crater. How did we end up with this huge crater in this position? Both the British and the Germans had organised themselves tunnelling companies. Um, certainly on the British side, these were specialist miners who were brought in uh, as part of the Royal Engineers tunnelling companies specifically to dig tunnels uh, underneath no man's land to create these uh, craters, to, to charge them with explosives. Um, so these were men who'd worked in coal mines uh, back in the UK and were yeah. brought over specifically to continue that work here on the Western Front? Yeah, men who worked in coal mines from all over the UK men who'd worked on extensions of the London underground system, guys who were working, restoring and repairing uh, the Victorian sewers underneath Manchester. What happened here when that mine went up? The Hawthorne Ridge Redoubt, parts of it collapsed um, and uh, men were trapped uh, within the redoubt. Uh, as you can see from the scale of the crater here, many men would of course have been killed. But the Germans had defence in depth. This 
was a frontline position, but many of the Germans would have been in uh, a, a trench just slightly behind this line. Uh, so the Germans came up from the second line, got onto this lip of the crater before the, the British soldiers, who had much further distance uh, to, to move forward, could uh, capture the lip on the other side. Which meant that as the, uh, the guys were coming forward, they came under a rain of machine gun fire and small arms fire before they even got to the lip. They managed to hold that side of the crater until about 12 noon on the day of the 1st of July, when a German counterattack forced them back to their starting position. John, let's go down and, and have a closer look at the crater from the bottom. Okay. The first thing that strikes me, John, is it's not, it's not a big round hole. I mean, it's, it's elongated. It's, it's really an oval shape, isn't it? Why, why the odd shape of this crater? Uh, that's because this is not one crater, but two joined together, if you like. The first crater was blown on the 1st of July, 20 past seven in the morning. Um, but this ground wasn't captured or held at that time. Uh, so another attack came through here. That was on the 13th of November, 1916, when a second crater was blown. The tunnels reopened the tunnels. They came back through here, set another mine charge and blew it again. So this was the first crater on this side. Correct. And then, so it's really a figure eight. There's a second it is. crater here on our left, it is which was the one from November, 1916. It actually feels quite eerie to be right here on the 14th of November, 102 years and one day since this part of the crater was blown. They would have been experiencing the same thing we are probably, the fog and the cold. The fog and, and the cold and the mist, yeah. yeah. You do feel it, don't you? You feel that connection. I'm feeling it now. We're, we're walking with ghosts here, it's incredible. <laughs> Just a few hundred metres from Hawthorne Crater is another place that gives you an insight into the events of 1916. It's one of the few places where trenches from the Battle of the Somme have been preserved. This is the Newfoundland Memorial Park, so called because of the Newfoundland Regiment that attacked here on the 1st of July 1916. And they had a terrible time in the grounds where we are. A British unit had attacked before them and had suffered very badly. And so then the Newfoundland Regiment was sent into the front line and ordered to carry out an attack of their own. By this time, the Germans were ready, they were waiting, they knew an attack was coming. And the poor old Newfies found that the trenches were so bogged with dead and wounded that they couldn't even make it to their own front line. So their commanders ordered them out of the trenches and said, let's go across the open ground. And they were terribly exposed to German machine gun fire. And as they moved across the trenches, a lot of them were hit even before they reached their own front line. It was just an absolute tragedy. And they've preserved these trenches now. And here we are standing in the British trench heading towards the front line. And it's absolutely extraordinary. It's not until you get down amongst these trenches, until you get in here and can see how cramped it is, how exposed you are as soon as you step into open ground, that you get an understanding for what the Somme fighting was really all about. So just imagine the situation for the poor old Newfies on the 1st of July 1916. They're coming up through these trenches, they're stepping over the bodies of their, their dead and wounded comrades. And then, you know, they would have been aghast when all of a sudden their commanders said, climb out of these trenches, boys, walk across the open ground. We've got to get to the front line in time for the attack. Just a generally really horrific situation all around. And so the poor old Newfies climbed out of their trenches, advanced across this open ground. They were cut down pretty swiftly. And at the end of the day, after the attack was over, of the 800 or so who'd gone into battle, more than 700 had been killed or wounded. So this really saw the end of the Newfoundland Regiment as a fighting force in the First World War. And today it's been preserved much as it was on the 1st of July, 1916. The wonderful thing about this park is it gives us a really good impression of how trench systems worked during the First World War. When we say trenches, we, we tend to just think of one continuous line of trench, but it actually wasn't like that at all. There were rows and rows of trenches. There was the frontline trench, support trenches, reserve trenches, and we get a really good example here. That was a support trench I was just in, and as we come further forward, this is a communication trench leading forward towards the front line. 
So imagine the poor Newfoundlanders at this point on the 1st of July, 1916. They've had to fight their way past the dead and wounded comrades in the support trenches. Then their officers have ordered them up out of the trenches into this area, this exposed ground. So men would have been falling all around me as they headed forward in July, 1916. And then as we get further forward, eventually after losing so many men, they arrived at their own front line, which is just here. And then the real challenge began. They'd lost half their number, they were in the front line trench and they still had to cross this huge expanse of no man's land towards the German trenches, which are on the far ridge behind us. So just a horrific situation for the Newfoundlanders and none of them got very far into no man's land at all before they're all shot down. This battered stump is called the danger tree and it marks the furthest point reached by any of the Newfoundlanders in the, in the attack on the 1st of July. 1916 and the thing that's flabbergasting about this is we've come probably 100 meters from their frontline trench so the ordeal of that morning they were exposed to fire from before they even reached their front line they got to the front line they had to keep coming forward and they only got this far and when you look out on the expanse of no man's land it's probably half a kilometer over to the german trenches no man's land was incredibly wide at this point the newfoundlanders had a huge amount of distance to cover and they'd lost most of their numbers by the time they even reached this tree here So we've crossed no man's land now. That's the British front line over on the horizon behind us. And we're now approaching the German trenches. So this is where that horrendous volume of fire came from. The Germans, once the artillery barrage subsided, they came scrambling up from their underground dugouts. They manned these deep trenches and they poured fire into the poor Brits advancing across the ground behind us. So this is the German front line position. This is, these are the, the German trenches where this hail of fire came from into both the British and the Newfoundland troops. And when you look at them, the first thing you can see is how much deeper they are than the British positions. They're deep, they're strong. These were very permanent positions that the Germans had dug. And the reason they'd done that is the Germans weren't going anywhere. They'd captured this ground, they'd captured large chunks of France and Belgium. And they said basically to the Allies, if you want us to leave, you push us out. They were going to stay here for as long as it possibly took and so they dug very deep defences, they dug in for a long time, they reinforced their trenches with concrete and with timber and these were very very strong positions, almost impervious to allied shell fire. The British on the other hand and the Allies, their position was we are not going to let the Germans advance another inch, every step we take now is going to be pushing the Germans back. So the British trenches in comparison, quite shallow, not permanent at all, these German positions, very deep, very strong, it was going to be impossible for the British to break in. Just behind the German trenches is this really magnificent memorial to the 51st Highland Division. It was a Scottish unit that attacked here in November 1916. And we should remember that about the Battle of the Somme, that it's not just about the 1st of July. Obviously the 1st of July was a, a really important moment. It was a, a monumental moment in the Battle of the Somme. But the Somme battle went on for four months and on the 13th of November another attack took place here and this one was quite successful. They attacked from closer to the German trenches in no man's land, they came across here, they captured the positions and they did what, the, what their comrades couldn't do on the 1st of July and that was force the Germans out of these positions and gain this ground for the Allies. This memorial is really a great example of how the fighting evolved on the Somme between the 1st of July and the 13th of November, the attacks were revolutionised. The 51st Highland Division that fought here had a much easier task than their unfortunate comrades who'd fought here in July. They had better artillery, better preparation, they were supported by tanks. This was an attack that worked in as many ways as the 1st of July one didn't. I love this memorial because it's not just a great monument to fighting men, but the sculptor took his time to get it right. Often when you see these memorials on the Western Front, they're a, a loose representation of the soldiers who fought here, but this one is very accurate. The sculptor has taken his time, everything from the uniform, the weapons the soldier is carrying, the kit that he's carrying. So it's really just a fantastic representation of the men who fought here. A hundred years on, the land here is green and peaceful. It's hard to really imagine life in these trenches. But there is a place that can give you a sense of what a working trench was like. Not in a battlefield, but in a restaurant. 
This is the La Tommy Cafe in the village of Pozier, and it may look like a spot where you can just get a cup of coffee and a baguette, but come and have a look at this. The local owner has spent decades collecting material from the battlefields in this region, and now it's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, just have a look at some of the things we've got around us over here. I mean, the shells. These shells were collected from the fields around Pozier. There's 20,000 in this, in this field alone, and they represent the number of shells fired on Pozier village in a single day during the war. 20,000 of them, all collected from nearby. But it just gets better. Look what's down here. They have basically recreated an entire trench system in the backyard of the cafe. Now, it's not pristine, it's not a museum, it's not trying to be a museum. What it is, is just showing you how much stuff is lying around and how this would have all come together in a trench system. So it replicates the claustrophobia, it replicates the dank, the darkness. I mean, just look at some of the stuff here. There's a, there's a German helmet that this would have been picked up from the fields. This would have been worn by a German soldier during the war. Just extraordinary. I'm holding it in my hands, living history right there. And look, for comparison, here's a British helmet. So you can see the difference between even the shape, the, the construction of the British and the German helmets. The German one, much more effective. The British helmet, not quite so good, but it's a standard design. I mean, this is recognizable from the First World War and the Second World War. And again, this would have been worn by a soldier during the war. Oh, and just look what we've got around here. We've got mortars, we've got dummies wearing uniforms. It's just extraordinary, the amount of detail, the amount of stuff that's here. And this is just from looking around in the fields outside Pozier. Imagine what is lying around in the battlefields of the Somme. This is a great example here of technology and innovation during the First World War. This is, a, this is called a screw picket. It was for holding barbed wire in front of the trenches. And at the start of the war, these were just poles that would be bashed into the ground by a hammer. But you can understand that a man out at night time laying barbed wire trying to hammer in one of these pickets soon became a target for any of the machine guns. So they came up with this great innovation. They put this screw attachment on the bottom, they made them this screw shape, and it meant that they could be put in the ground and then screwed into place silently. And so every night out on the battlefields, out in no man's land, you would see working parties going out with these screw pickets and laying barbed wire entanglements, hopefully silently, thanks to the screw picket design. So we've just seen the British side over there, and as we come through here, we're on the German side. <laughs> it's really quite extraordinary, the work that Dominique has done to set this up. So now, now we're in the German side of the trench, and all the gear here is German. So these are German rifle grenades that we have here. So the pole goes down the barrel of the rifle, especially reinforced rifle because there was a lot of pressure on it, and then a blank round would fire this out of the rifle to propel the grenade much further than an individual could throw them. This is incredible here as well. We've got trench armour. This is actually going back to the medieval ages almost. This is armour that they would use in the frontline trench in the hope that if a shell landed or a sniper fired at them, they would be protected. So it worked with varying levels of success, but that's very, very rare to find that, uh, in a, you know, especially in good condition like that is. Just absolutely extraordinary. German machine gun rounds littering the floor. I don't know if a trench would have been quite this messy during the war, but it certainly gives you a good idea of the gear, the equipment, and the way the soldiers lived during the thick of the fighting. Just a short drive out of town is the site of a particularly vicious battle. Later in July, about the 23rd, Australian troops were sent in to this part of the line. This is Pozier. This is the highest point on the entire Somme battlefield. And where I'm standing now, is the remains of the old windmill. This had stood here for centuries in the town of Pozier, and the Germans had turned this into a defensive position. Machine guns, mortars all around, and there were two lines of trenches out in the fields in front of us. Now the Aussies had quite a task on their hands to come in and seize this high ground. So the Australians came in on the 23rd of July. They fought up until the beginning of September, and during that time they lost 23,000 men in the fields around us. This is the most costly battlefield in the history of Australia. The other thing that makes this spot so special is this was the place where tanks were first used in battle. During the Battle of the Somme in September 1916, tanks attacked from this position. And this is the memorial that tells their story. This is the tank memorial. And as you can see, it's got these quite wonderful miniatures of tanks all around. It's also got, if I show you over here, 
This fence is made up, these are actually gun barrels from First World War tanks, and this is drive chain from the tank. So the memorial itself is part of a tank. And the other thing that I think is fascinating about this spot is this road, the main road behind us, was the road that the Germans used as they rolled through France in 1940. And these First World War memorials were not immune from that fighting. And this tank over here even has bullet damage from fighting here in World War II. So this place suffered during the First World War and it suffered again during the Second World War. This poor old corner of France was never far away from the action. So after the use of tanks, new innovations, new way of fighting the war, the Battle of the Somme was finally won. It dragged on until November, but at the end of that, it was a British victory. We achieved what we set out to do. But that victory came at an enormous cost. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers were killed or wounded. And there's no better place to remember them than here, the Tietval Memorial to the Missing. There's more than 72,000 names on this memorial, just the missing. These were the men who have no known grave. And the fact that this memorial is here at all is reflective of a really forward-thinking decision that was made by British authorities after the war. They wanted every man to be remembered by name, whether that was on a headstone or on a memorial such as this one. So now across the Western Front, we see huge memorials carved with individual names of soldiers whose graves were never found. The important thing to remember when you look at these memorials and read these names is every one of these names is a lost man. Every name represents a grieving family, a community who'd lost someone, a life never really fulfilled. It's really special to come here, to walk around, to read the thousands of names on memorials like this one and just think about the huge cost of these battles. The entire memorial is covered in these huge tablets, each one bearing thousands of names and the names are laid out in a very specific order. They're laid out by regiment and then by rank and then they're alphabetical with each person's name. Often in the case of names like this, two soldiers with the same name and the same initial would then have their regimental number to differentiate them from each other. So the point of this was that grieving families could come here and find their missing soldier. This, is, this wasn't invented for us. This wasn't built so that we could come and remember a century later. This was built for grieving families. And the idea was they would come from, over from England, they would come here, they would find the regiment that their son belonged to, and they would find his name on the wall. And there was a real feeling that this was a connection with their son, that their son wasn't missing after all, but he was right here on this memorial. I think it's absolutely touching. This memorial opened in the 1930s and it was controversial from the start. Lots of people didn't like it. It was described as a big red heap of bricks on top of the hill. And I can see why people think that. I can see that it's certainly confronting. It doesn't fit in with the more sedate, the more solemn memorials that you see on other parts of the battlefields. But you know, I, I've always liked it. I think it's great. I think we do need a big memorial like this that stands out and shouts to the world about the missing of the Somme. They're, they're important and their stories are important that we tell. And on a great memorial like this one, where we've got the names of famous battles, Albert, Somme 1916, Guillemot, all the famous British battles, all the British men brought together. I think that's a story worth telling and they do it very, very well here. I'm always in two minds when I think of the Battle of the Somme because it's hard to get past those immense losses, the tragedy of the first day, the hundreds of thousands of men killed or wounded. But at the end of the day, it was a victory. This was a British victory. And from this point onwards, the Germans realized they would not win the First World War. But in some ways, I think trying to th remember the battle in terms of statistics or strategy or outcomes is really missing the point because that history is important as, as it is. It belongs to the past. There's a reality that belongs to the present, however, and that's these names. That's the men who are recorded here, the men who are recorded in the cemetery behind me. That's the real story that belongs to today. And these men still have stories to tell. They still have lessons to teach us. The only question is, do we have the determination and the courage to hear them?